So yeah, this is my brand that I've created. I call myself Impatient Health. Um, I like the fact it had the word patient in it, but I also like the fact that um, we uh, obviously haven't got long to hang around. Um, and um, I often start my presentations by saying, COVID is just an accelerant, or does it really have to be? I don't think it has to be. People talk about how uh, things have sped up, that our three-year plans became three-month plans when, when COVID hit. Uh, and I think that um, that's actually a very uh, lazy way of thinking about the world. I think that um, we have an opportunity here to make significant change. Hopefully you guys are the sort of people that would agree with that. Um, I often compare this for, as a sort of web 1.0 to 2.0 uh, and the, the migration from the original set of technology firms that sort of GeoCities and Yahoo's and AOL's of this world, uh, which no longer really even exist. Uh, and of course, the, the 2.0 generation that we're all very familiar with. Um, and the disruption that's been so severe that those 1.0 generation companies only 20 years after being founded no longer even exist. Um, and we in pharma, of course, uh, say we've been disrupted, but we, we haven't really to that extent. But the interesting thing I think about the move from 1.0 or web 1.0 to 2.0 is that what changed underneath? What actually caused the 1.0 to 2.0 change? Did something big in the, in the world happen? Um, actually, not a lot happened. Simply, the internet got a bit faster and it became a bit more ubiquitous. And yet that was enough to kind of create um, a new generation of business models. So whilst the incumbent industry might be saying COVID is just an accelerant, I'm fairly confident that in garages all around the world, there is a new generation of 2.0 companies that uh, are built on a different playing field that will soon um, have a significant impact. So um, this is Mike Tyson. Hopefully you will recognize this man. Uh, and what I uh, thought was probably the smartest thing he ever said was, was this, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, and uh, indeed, um, right now, we are facing a future that at best you could describe as uncertain. Uh, and uh, any plan or any idea that you might have had previously is, um, probably under question right now. And indeed, I believe that it, um, we don't have a new normal that we're actually focusing on. Uh, we actually have new normals. Uh, we're gonna have a continuing state of um, ongoing movement. There isn't gonna be some kind of stasis or position that we find ourselves in. So what we of course need is this uh, other rather often quoted phrase, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent of the species of eyes and rather the most adaptable I feel. This is an overused quote, of course, but I actually feel that right now is perhaps the first legitimate time to actually use it. Uh, I, uh, we need to be flexible and adaptable as opposed to actually having a single plan at all. And that is going to um, uh, sort the winners from the losers going forward. Um, I'm not going to talk about agility and, and things like that and, and that today, which I, I'm sure you're all familiar with. But what I do want to talk about is uh, something I call unconscious wellness, which might sound like a bit of a paradoxical phrase. Um, and it's designed to sort of illustrate the change in consumer behavior that I think will um, influence healthcare quite significantly going forward. So um, one way of uh, starting at this is to think about the fact that, of course, on our um, own phones, um, this is the typical readout you get when you work onto a health app. And, you know, there's a lot of information here. I would argue perhaps too much information. Um, it seems to me that um, there's this great desire at the moment to provide transparency, to provide measurement, to provide readings, to provide all of this information. Um, and uh, I would argue that that's perfectly fine for a very small segment of the audience that enjoys reading graphs and enjoys getting into their own personal stats. But it's actually not good enough for the vast majority of people who are not excited about graphs and not excited about looking into their readings. I told Jim the other day, I discovered that the distance I have between steps is 73 centimeters. Well, you know, what the hell am I going to do with that information? Um, but it's it's there on your phone if you, if you look for it. Um, and then I think about something like YouTube, which of course, again, we're all familiar with. Um, but YouTube, man, it's what a hassle. You actually have to know what video you want to go and look for. You actually have to type something to a search bar. 
That is, of course, far too inconvenient for our modern times. And it's why perhaps uh, we have a rise in other alternative platforms like TikTok, where you no longer have to choose what it is that you're looking for. You no longer have to consciously understand what you want to watch today. You simply open the app and you are fed the information. Of course, it's the algorithm behind the scenes that is determining what it is that we should or shouldn't watch. Uh, and indeed, this is a more passive form of consumption, um, which is in many ways more addictive and more enjoyable uh, to, to many people, hence the rise of these, these platforms. But of course, it's not just related to um, video and uh, and uh, this is just a quote for people who, <laughs> sorry, when I talk to pharma people, of course, half of them have never even heard of TikTok, so I actually have to explain what it is. Um, but of course, there are lots of uh, brands and new brands which uh, where we're, we're actually removing consumer choice deliberately. Choice is a big misnomer. The average consumer doesn't want choice. The average consumer wants to be helped into a decision and perhaps even have had, have had that decision made for them. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with many of these companies um, which, which uh, where the, well, the algorithm is the, is the, is the, is the uh, selector for uh, much of what we consume. Uh, as we become busier in our lives, this kind of passive uh, stuff is becoming uh, absolutely key. And uh, uh, a good, uh, good person that I follow, maybe some of you guys do, Scott Galloway, often refers to this as uh, e-commerce as opposed to e-commerce, algorithmic commerce. Uh, I think we're going to now move into a wellness, algorithmic wellness where it's not necessarily a conscious choice you remember those graphs i showed you at the beginning where we don't have to be experts in reading our graphs and understanding it where we are either through more subtle nudges or through uh, actual guidance and uh, moving almost towards a digital twin model um, we are being increasingly encouraged to look after our own healthcare in a more subtle or passive way and i think that that is absolutely where we're going forward so i just wanted to illustrate, I guess, to start with that this kind of power to the people movement and the, the general um, ability for patients or just everyday people to actually um, define the future of healthcare is coming across in multiple forms. Um, in pharma, of course, we tend to think that um, the only form of healthcare comes from drug research, which, you know, to everybody else listening in this room, you know, that's probably the last form of healthcare that you think of. But uh, we, we, in pharma, we get blindsided as to, to what, the, what the possibilities actually are uh, in terms of, 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 of um, preventative care and wellness. Pharmaceutical companies don't, don't believe that prevention is an opportunity at all. They simply don't see a business model. They don't see the existence of it happening because all they can think about is developing very solution-oriented drugs, which have a very defined clinical trial and approval process, uh, which simply doesn't work for the preventative market. How do you put a preventative measure through a clinical trial? Well, you could argue that vaccines are preventative, um, but you need a lot of data, as we've just seen, um, to be able to determine whether or not they work or not. Um, but can you put other things through a preventative measure? It's very, very difficult. So a lot of the movement in the pharma industry right now is all about pill plus or beyond the pill as the phrases often are it's it's about finding the value outside of the medicine complementing the medicine um, and being able to uh, still put that through some kind of clinical trial or, or whatever it is to prove prove its value prove its worth um, and and to be able to use the huge global scale that pharmaceutical companies actually have to get those solutions out to patients whether they be um, you know, traditional drugs or new digital solutions in whatever way they can. Uh, everyone following me so far? Everything makes sense? Yeah? I see some nodding heads. That's good. Um, so um, oh, this was my, uh, the, by the way, I should have, should have said at the beginning, I did not have time to prepare this presentation. <laughs> I tried very, very hard, um, but uh, you'll find that my slides actually run out um, in a short moment and I'm going to just <laughs> have to move to voice only. Uh, and this slide uh, was supposed to appear at the beginning. So there you go, there's an example of what I've done. Um, good citizenship. Um, this is, uh, uh, I, I typed this into Google and this was the first picture that, that came up. Um, we tend to associate good citizenship with, you know, not littering, with recycling, with 
being aware of climate change and, and being uh, uh, conscious of, of generations ahead of us. Um, I believe that a new form of good citizenship is on the cusp of appearing. Um, perhaps we need a, a Greta Thunberg of, of healthcare to, to make it finally appear. But um, I believe that um, as a result of the exposure to uh, the um, vaccine development process that the whole world has, has just witnessed, um, that uh, there is a stronger sense of almost medical citizenship being willing to contribute to the advance of healthcare, the advance of medicines, whatever it might be, uh, and consciousness of how much effort and expense and difficulty is typically involved, and that it's something that ideally for the good of the world needs to be improved. And um, I talk to people every day in the pharma industry who tell me that it's never been easier to recruit for clinical trials than it is today. Why? Not because the technology's necessarily helped, not because the world has necessarily changed, but simply that basic awareness of what the hell is going on and the fact that it is a potential possibility for some people, particularly those who are frustrated with the current healthcare options. Uh, and, uh, and so they're finding it a lot easier than ever before. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but every single day that a clinical trial is um, delayed, in the pharma industry is usually equivalent to about $8 million in lost value for a drug. So time is the most expensive factor when it comes to building and making clinical trials work. It's the, it's the enemy. And the simple difficulty in finding and recruiting and consenting and profiling and actually managing patients into a clinical trial is something which you would think we had figured out by now, but it's still archaic. It's still incredibly traditional. So um, something that I would love to explore perhaps with you guys, or certainly I'm exploring it with other people already, is this idea that um, we could actually produce a new kind of business model in um, the pharma industry or in, or in, in the development of, of medicines. Um, and when I showed this, um, web uh, 1.0, 2.0 picture earlier. Um, something that's very interesting to me is that all of the logos on the right relate to a single type of business model, actually, um, which is what I call a platform business model. And there are many uh, uses of the word platform. It's a bit of an overused word. What I mean by a platform is something that brings together buyers and sellers. And all of these logos and all of these companies are effectively middlemen. Google was probably the first simply bringing together web browsers and web website creators. And the search engine was simply a way of connecting the two. Um, obviously, you don't need me to explain how Uber connects passengers with drivers and Airbnb connects property owners with people wanting to stay. But of course, the old adage of uh, um, these companies don't actually own their product, but they simply um, connect people that do is very key. Uber doesn't own any cars and Airbnb doesn't own any properties, et cetera. I think there's a new business model available for a new kind of company which creates drugs, but doesn't own them. And that would be just in that definition, completely unique. Because right now, every single company that produces drugs owns them. And in fact, they own the entire chain. That's why these pharma companies are so huge. They own the, uh, the, the 10 year development process and the 10-year commercialization process that is inherent in every single drug you take. Not sure if you guys know how expensive it is to produce a drug right now. It's doubled in the time that I've been involved in the industry to about $2.5 billion per drug on average. So it's not small fry to develop a drug. You or I are probably not going to develop a pharma company anytime soon. Um, so um, anyway, um, I think there's a way of combining this new desire to contribute to healthcare and the platform style business model, which would effectively create almost like a bottom-up pharma company or a bottom-up medicine organization, as opposed to the only top-down method that exists today, where you sort of say, I've developed a molecule in a lab, and now I need to go and find the patients. Well, could it not be possible for patients to be volunteering their, their data into a system that then identified where drug opportunities or healthcare opportunities in general could actually sit. 
Do you need a large number of people? Probably not. You probably don't need um, more than 0.01% of uh, people in the world to actually want to contribute to medical research for something like this to actually be viable. So, um, so I believe that there is a, a new opportunity. And I think this, my slides are going to run out very soon. I've got a couple of slides here on obviously the network effects that platforms create and why the value of them um, becomes so strong. You can actually use something called Metcalfe's law to determine uh, indeed how, how valuable networks are. I'm not going to go into that. Um, I have all sorts of stuff about different types of platform company and the different business models that they have. Um, but as I said to you earlier, the largest companies today either are platforms or have largest platform components. Um, and 67, 67% of unicorn startups are indeed also forming this platform business model. Uh, you can even read about it if you like. Um, uh, and it's interesting that platform-based companies are typically valued much higher than more transactional and traditional business models by definition, and in particular, subscription-based platform models with recurring revenue bundles that happen in various different ways. Um, right, so yeah, my slides run out here, but let me just go uh, a cappella for a moment, if that's all right. Um, I believe that there is an opportunity to create a sort of Web 2.0 drug development organization, um, which um, potentially rewards patients or people for voluntarily uh, offering up their own data into a, into a new organization that isn't a pharma company. Um, pharma companies are obviously not trusted. They, they have a very poor reputation. And so that's another reason why a new form of organization is desirable here. Um, but there is absolutely no reason why you can't almost gamify or um, find other ways to encourage patients to contribute their data. And one way of encouraging them is, of course, um, financial reward. Um, because it's certainly true that pharmaceutical companies and other organizations pay for data. They pay huge amounts of money for data today. Um, it's just a very inefficient process in actually producing it. And there's absolutely no reason why that money could not be distributed in a far smarter way, such that it could actually fall into the pockets of those who are contributing the data in the first place. Of course, you're probably familiar that there is a very strong movement uh, these days against organizations that feed off people's data, but without rewarding them for it. And uh, that happens in multiple uh, industries, but particularly in healthcare. So um, I have sort of conceptualized uh, a, a new form of company, um, which basically bring, brings the researchers on one side and the patients on the other into the same ecosystem. At the moment, they exist in very separate ecosystems, and that's part of the problem. Uh, and uh, it uh, provides a sort of dashboard for people who um, effectively want to earn from contributing their data. Um, if you think about that earning analogy, you could almost say the salary of those people is, is how much data they're contributing on a daily basis and their wealth or their bank account is how much um, they've contributed or how much they've uh, earned over time. Um, and uh, for researchers, there are all manner of uh, tools which now allow researchers to connect their sort of lab notes with a wider ecosystem to find connections within that ecosystem. So you can imagine that those same technologies could be used to identify where researchers care about new health opportunities and match with the patients that are actually going to um, help them as they try to recruit for clinical trials, as they try to understand the data landscape and find opportunities. And of course, there's a third group, which is the investment or finance community, which indeed is looking for the commercialization opportunities within that, that sphere. So um, I think I'm going to just pause at that point. I have no idea how long I've been talking for, but it feels like a while. Um, and um, not going into obviously a massive amount of detail on this new concept because I don't want to overload you guys, but uh, I'm very happy to chat about opportunities, questions, um, I, I can obviously tell you pretty much anything that you want to know about the pharma industry as well, if that's interesting to you about where their challenges and opportunities are and how they see the world. Uh, very happy to chat about that too.